I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spend Up ahead the road is bending Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. When you have plenty of time and a fine stretch of road, you find yourself asking questions. Here are some. How many nations in this nation? In Florida, we will visit Greece. Here's another question. Can you find the whole spirit and most of the history of an entire state on one porch in one man? You can, we will discover, if the state is Kansas and the man on the porch is Alf Landon. Alf Landon embodies the spirit of Kansas. This gardener is the Bishop of Spokane. He embodies another spirit altogether. Question. Why has a prince of the church chosen to live the life of a pauper? On the road in California, being passed by the most outlandish motorized contraptions, you wouldn't call them cars exactly, would you? The question to ask is, what's going on here? Here's a really pressing question, though, and one we mean to answer directly. Why in heaven's name did we take this road? I'm sure everybody who travels very much thinks he knows the worst stretch of winter highway in the USA. Well, after what we have just been through, we have a little nomination of our own. Up until last winter, if you wanted to pass from east to west across Wyoming, you went down US 30 through Bosler, Rock River, Medicine Bow, and on to Rollins. But now you can save 14 miles by taking the brand new Interstate 80, which cuts across the mountains. We have a little piece of advice for you. Don't try it. Everybody around here calls it the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We did try it on a balmy, sunny day, as nice a day as you ever get in the Wyoming winter. We headed west from Laramie without a care in the world. There was that sign, but we didn't pay much attention to it. Pretty soon, we began to pay attention to it as we encountered a motorist from California whose car had been blown off the road. Still, there was a passerby to help him back on the pavement, and we figured that was as bad as it would get. But farther up the interstate, it got worse. Winds began to buffet the bus, visibility dropped, huge trailer trucks roared by, slinging slush back at us, and snow plows fell in behind, fighting a losing battle with the swirling snow. Then it got a lot worse. The wind rose to what we later learned was 50 miles an hour. Visibility dropped to zero at times. It was hard to remember that just a few miles down the mountain on the old Highway 30, the sun was shining. We pulled off the interstate to take these pictures and then had an exhausting battle just to make it back to the bus. Afterwards, we had to stop filming because there was a 13-car accident right behind us and we had to rush one of the victims to the hospital in Laramie. The next day was much the same. At an interstate exit called Arlington, a one-time stagecoach stop on the Overland Trail, we consulted rancher Kim Kruger, who knows these mountains, about this wretched highway which now passes through them. Years ago, they made surveys through this country to try and run the Union Pacific Railroad through here because it is shorter between Laramie and, and Rollins. But uh, every time the engineers from the railroad would come back and say, of course, that this was just too much winter country to build a railroad through here, and we tried to tell them this, and of course, we know this, and uh, but it didn't do any good. They went ahead and built her. Well, this seems like uh, pretty bad weather to me. Does it ever get worse up here? 
Oh, uh, really, yes, it does get worse than it uh, today uh, is bad, but it's, it's not as bad as it can get. Of course, the highway is running today, and uh, when it gets a lot worse, uh, they'll close the highway. The next day, finally, the snowdrifts got too high, and the Ho Chi Minh Trail was closed. So we took old Highway 30 through towns which the interstate bypassed and which, therefore, are dying. Bosler, Rock River, and to a lesser extent Medicine Bow, present a sad parade of boarded up cafes, abandoned gas stations, businesses gone broke. The tourists who kept them going now struggle through the blizzards on the interstate to save 14 miles. Folks like Mrs. Gladys White, who runs the Rock River garage, are still shaking their heads over that. Well, why in the world did they build it up there? That is the question that everybody asks that. Every, why? It's been asked of, oh, everybody says, why did they put it up there? Wyoming people say, why did they put it up there? California people say, why did they put it up there? New Yorkers, everybody says, why did they put it up there? But they did. The Wyoming Highway Department acknowledges that this new section of Interstate 80 has been closed 120 hours this winter that 29 vehicles have so far been involved in accidents in one three-mile stretch. But they say the route is still the shortest and thus the best. And besides, they have new snow fences in mind. Well, the signs up there say, Interstate 80, your taxes at work. At a million dollars a mile, we thought you'd like to know how your taxes are working. So I thought, why should I talk about Kansas when Alf Landon still lives right here in Topeka? I went to see him. And there on his front porch in the morning sun, Alf Landon reflected on the subject he knows in his bones, his Kansas. In, in all those years in the face of the black blizzard and terrible blizzards and snowstorms in the wintertime, how people clung to those lands out there, there there's a, the land they had and went back year after year facing uh, all those rugged conditions. They were pretty tough uh, people. Uh, men stay on the farm because they love the soil. They love to cultivate the soil. They like animals. They like to raise animals. Uh, the children were given a pig maybe out of the litter or a calf. All of that uh, old uh, racial desired of a man to own a piece of land himself. So the settlers came out here, they not only wanted to have the right to vote, but they wanted to have the right to own their own land and fish on it when they damn pleased. He was, he was a shrewd man, that early Kansas farmer, was he? Like all farmers, not only Kansas farmers, but they all were the truly individuals. As you drive down some of the old roads of Kansas today, you do see an abandoned school or an abandoned church or an old homestead with the screen door flapping in the wind. Uh, it's kind of a sad uh, sight. I've like. had that experience many times, trying to imagine what was on. When that house was first built. It was probably quite a house for those days. Standing there now, dilapidated, doors open, no doors. Wind is all gone. Imagining the lives of the, of the people that lived in there and what happened to them, where they went, where they are now. You like Kansas? You bet I do. I love them. They didn't vote for me for president in 1936, but that didn't make any difference. There were issues that I could understand. And they like me, and I like them. We talked on through the morning, Alf Landon remembering Kansas. And always the talk came back to the land and the people on the land, working so hard not to feed the world, they just do that incidentally. It's more than that. It has something to do with saving up to send the kids to Kansas State, something to do with the love of hoeing and mowing and raking and bailing, of working hard, and when you feel like it, of fishing where you damn please.
You drive into Tarpon Springs expecting to find just another small town on the Gulf Coast. And the first thing that hits your eye when you step out is Persia slaying Medusa. That gives you the idea Tarpon Springs is not just another American town. The men who talk in the sun speak Greek, and the tune on the jukebox is Greek. And the aroma on the street is of lamb cooking on a skewer, an onion, and oregano. The whole design of the boats in the harbor is unchanged since the golden age of Athens, and their purpose is the same now as it was then, to harvest sponges far at sea. Only Greeks are divers here, and the divers are kings. In port, you can find the sponge men at the Port Said, where the bouzouki plays its ancient song, and the dance of the veils goes on until morning. they repair to the coffee shop where no woman may enter to play the old game Kunga and to drink the black coffee. George Belirus's father's father's father was a sponge man. And why is he still a sponge man? Well, because I don't believe anywhere in this country or in this world, for that matter, you can find a more exciting life. There's a gaiety, there's an anxiety, there's a sorrow when you lose men or when men are hurt, as sometimes they often are. And you exercise, I believe, every emotion that a man can possibly exercise. And these are all realistic. They're not false. They're no pretense because it's uh, definitely a man's world. And we live in a man's world and think as men. You do things with a certain amount of dignity and with the air of responsibility and you maintain. So to work around a group of men that think the same, act the same, feel the same, and still, still each man is his own man in his own rights, I think that's worth a little bit more than the sign of a dollar bill. We carried the music of the bouzouki around in our heads for days after that, and George Belirus's words about his life. That's the thing about Americans. You ask them a simple question, and they're liable to answer you. The Catholic Chancery for Eastern Washington, office of the Bishop of Spokane, the Most Reverend Bernard J. Topol, is a monumental building with an imposing entrance. The bishop never uses the entrance. He comes and goes through a back door that leads to an alley where he parks his small 10-year-old car. He used to have a big car, not anymore. He used to have a mansion on a hill. He sold it and gave the money to the poor and moved to a house in a decayed neighborhood. He spends nothing for food. He gardens and eats fish head soup. He spends nothing for clothing. He wears a tattered old sweater. The Bishop of Spokane, spiritual leader of 70,000 Roman Catholics, has become, by choice, a poor man. He invited us home. You'll see, he said, that the house needs painting. And he said, people have offered to paint it for me, but I feel that's like scrubbing floors. House painting, he said, is just something I should do for myself. Here's uh, where I spend most of my time, most of the year. Uh, this room uh, actually heats up with a little sun on a cold day, uh, all the window space. And I don't do my washing here, but you, you've probably never seen a washing machine like this. But uh, uh, this do you, is... Do you do your own laundry? Uh, all of it. While he's changing to his gardening clothes, the bishop invited us to look around the house. Here's the total he paid for groceries for the house. December 1971, 61 cents. January 72, 70 cents. Since then, nothing at all. This uh, sort of wobbly table is the bishop's working desk. It is half in the kitchen and half in his chapel, which he says is not by accident. The chapel is a simple one of the kind you might find in any devout poor man's house. 
Leaning against the wall over there is the crozier, the bishop's symbol of authority. Most croziers are made of gold and precious jewels. His is a wooden shepherd's staff. This gardener, raising tomatoes, potatoes, and cabbages with which to feed himself, has degrees from Harvard, Catholic University, and Notre Dame. For others, he has opened homes for the homeless, for unwed mothers and retarded children, and subsidized low-income housing. For himself, he wants nothing. I feel that Christ expects me to live this way, that if I, that if I don't live this way, that I, that I would be sinning. There are some people that are uh, character, uh, the way they've been brought up or whatever, uh, that they cannot literally help themselves. We have to help them out of poverty. And, and I feel that when Christ said that we're to love others as, as, uh, as he loves us, well, well, he died for us. And I have to be willing to do things like that, to, 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 uh, to go that far. Uh, I hope that isn't too, too long a sermon for you. <laughs> Are you used to sermons? <laughs> you you don't from, answer. Not from gardeners. <laughs> The most reverend Bernard J. Topol says he has become less the administrator, more the pastor. He says he thinks less now and loves more. We left him in his garden, on his knees. Nowhere else, of course, is transportation quite the cult that it has become in Southern California. A bemused car dealer named Don Burns, may be worried about the gas shortage, designed a Volkswagen that gets 100 miles to the gallon. Just one of many bug mutations. Thousands of California kids have discovered that with a little work, the Volkswagen can be made even uglier. Also louder and faster. So everywhere you look, they're chopping the front end, flaring the fenders, narrowing the running board, widening the tires, tuning the muffler, and adding pinstriping by a freehand artist named Shaky Jake from Costa Mesa. The car culture has gone buggy over the Beetle, and there's no telling where it will all end. We thought maybe Gerhard Geisler's wrought iron version might be the ultimate in custom bug bodies. But no, there are bug metamorphoses in Southern California beyond an effete Easterner's imagination. Resort bugs and dune bugs. Oh, yeah. This one driven terrifyingly by racing driver Richie Ginther for an afternoon's relaxation. started out as plain, ordinary Volkswagens. So did the three-wheeled bug of Big Daddy Roth, to whom we turn for an explanation of this phenomenon. Big Daddy is known as the king of the car freaks, and his creations are enshrined at a place called Cars of the Stars. But he was a kid once himself. Uh, you got to get a kid interested and make him learn with his own two hands, because this is going to make the machinist of the future. This is going to train him for the for that rocket job at Cape Kennedy. It's going to train him for all those things. All those hot rodders after the war were really training themselves for, for, for the future, for that trip to the moon. Those are all ex-hot rodders. The same hot rodder that's working on that little bug today. That's he's, He hasn't changed. Only the time has changed. Only the car has changed. The, the, the bug is really the Model T of the 70s. It's very comfortable, except for all the uh, butterflies hitting me in the face. <laughs> Well, they say that you can always tell a good bike rider by the number of bugs he has in his teeth. Because as you're going along, those bugs hit you in the mouth. and Sometimes you get salty ones, and sometimes you get real sweet ones. The butterflies are real sweet. Things that start in Southern California have a disconcerting way of sweeping the nation. So this is fair warning. You may soon find your son busy with a blowtorch cutting a VW bus down to size. and like Jack Egger of North Hollywood, doing wheelies on the supermarket parking lot. And do not laugh at these mutations, sir and madam, for by the time the California car freaks are finished, 
there may be in your own future a $35,000 chauffeur-driven Volkswagen limousine. Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years, I've been a wandering Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around